return to the end. Hi ho! Ho, 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 and happy holidays. That's right, here at Pick 6 Movies, we are decking the halls and bowing the holly as we get ready for Santa to come and put a bow on season 22 of our show. If you'll recall, we call this season Deja U, and we've been subjecting ourselves to some of the worst remakes of some of the best horror movies in the history of cinema. But that all ends here, with this episode in which your fearless friends will be putting a creepy doll under the tree with the remake of the killer doll classic, Child's Play. Spoilers, we end up in a place where this isn't the worst movie we think we ever saw, unlike some movies I might mention. I'm looking at you, Nightmare on Elm Street remake, jerk. If you've never listened before, what we'll do is whip a little knowledge on you up front, this time, these honors are done by my oldest and best pal, Chad Cooper, and then I, Bo Ransdell, will be back after to help him troubleshoot this techno-horror treat. So enough of the rapping, let's open this gift and celebrate the end of a season with Child's Play. Take it away, Chad. And we are back in the studio to record the introduction for the finale of this season, and what, to my wondering eye, should appear? It's Garrett the Intern! Garrett, I see you're wearing your... Krampus knows you've been naughty t-shirt. It's one of your holiday t-shirts, Garrett. Garrett, are all of your t-shirts novelty themed full of art from obscure anime or quirky strangeness that only you and people like you understand here? <laughs> I had a feeling that was the case. Garrett the intern, this is the time of the giving season, and I, like many, like to give to others. So I got you, Garrett the intern, a special gift. Garrett, look under the control board. Look down there and see if there's something that resembles a gift a normal person like me would give to an adorable weirdo like you, Garrett. There, that's it. Open it up. There you go. Uh, don't be gentle. Ah, you like it? <laughs> to, to answer your rhetorical question, it is what you think it is. Zuni Fetish Warrior Doll from the 1975 horror film Trilogy of Terror. And the guy I bought it from on the internet, he offered to put a curse on it so that it, and I quote from his email, may come to life and terrorize but will not kill its owner, end quote. I paid an extra five bucks for that curse on that doll there, Garrett, so it's got to be legit. <laughs> you are very welcome. Garrett, the intern, as this is the last introduction we will be working on before you head back to wherever it is that you came from and then go off to do school and make the world a better place, Garrett. <laughs> I don't need to hear things like that, Garrett. Garrett, do me a favor. Give me a little Festivus for the rest of us music, and let's talk about what I can only assume is one of your favorite topics, toys that kill children. When most people think about dangerous toys to give to kids, one that immediately comes to mind is the official Red Ryder Carbon Action 200 shot range model air rifle with a compass in the stock and this thing that tells time that is given to Ralphie in the holiday classic A Christmas Story. But that's a gun. Putting that in the hands of a child is a bit of a no-brainer when it comes to situations that may lead to physical harm of the child or other children, or maybe neighborhood animals. And BB guns don't even come close to topping the list of dangerous toys to be inconceivably conceived by adults as appropriate play things for children. Back in the 1950s, the United States and Russia were feeling the chill of the Cold War. Americans were settling into a post-World War II era where science and technology, specifically atomic research, was all the craze. And so the brilliant minds at the A.C. Gilbert Company put together one of the most insane insanely dangerous toys of all time, the U-238 Atomic Energy Lab. It was a small red case that included all the items budding junior scientists from the 1950s would need to spark his, and let's be honest, not her, future career in the world of atomic research. A woman scientist in the 1950s? <laughs> what next? A dog driving a car? Indeed, 1950s era male chauvinism. Upon opening the toy case, children would find an assortment of items to pique their scientific interests, including four small jars of actual uranium, including beta alpha, beta, and gamma radiation <laughs> sources. It included a cloud chamber and a spintharoscope to watch atoms decay, and an electroscope and a Geiger counter to see if any of the items from your science kit erroneously made their way to places they shouldn't be, like outside of the containers they came in. <laughs> 
The manual for this nightmare in a box was filled with lovable cartoon characters, including Blondie and Dagwood Bumstead, as well as Mandrake the Magician, to explain concepts like how to split atoms. Now, this all sounds incredibly dangerous, because it was, and that's why the A.C. Gilbert Company included a warning to children that they, quote, should not take ore samples out of their jars, for they tend to flake and crumble and would run the risk of having radioactive ore spread out in your laboratory, end quote. Were any children or family members killed by this toy? Probably. But less than 5,000 of them were sold, because back in the day they cost 50 bucks a pop, and that was in the 1950s. So the toy kits disappeared from store shelves only a year after they showed up. Science and technology seems to be at the center of most toys that end up killing kids. Multiple toys that use magnets to spark a child's creative mind were put out into the market only to find their way inside the child's mouth and then to the child's small intestines, where these plastic and magnet combos would wreak havoc on digestion, inability to make poopies, and sometimes death. Rose art magnet sets, Zen magnets, Neo Balls magnets, Digidots, they all ended up in some kid's belly, leading to hospital visits and sometimes the morgue. Science and the law of gravity struck again when lawn darts showed up in the 1980s. These oversized, colorful darts were about the size of a football. Now, the idea of this toy was that children would toss them up into the air and have them land on the ground inside hoop targets to earn points. Unfortunately, the darts had giant metal pointed tips, and as they returned to Earth, they were also quite capable of puncturing a child's skull, eventually killing three children. By 1988, lawn darts were banned, and it was recommended that all known sets be destroyed. In 2007, Aquadots was a creative arts and crafts toy where children could connect small plastic dots into any 3D shape that they could imagine. But kids being kids, they naturally put the dots in their mouth. But who can blame them? There were no magnets embedded in plastic around for them to eat. But it turned out that Aquadots were coated in a chemical that converted into GHB. Say, GHB? Isn't that the date rape drug? Indeed it is. So aqua dots were pulled from the shelves. In that same year, Planet Toys released a CSI fingerprint examination kit based on the TV franchise CSI. You know the show that's over on the CBS television network? The network that you can't get enough of when you're forced to watch television with your grandparents. This fingerprint examination kit provided literally minutes of fun for inquiring children until someone realized that the kit contained asbestos which can lead to cancer, which can lead to death, which led to this toy being pulled from shelves. Of course, most toy companies don't plan to release a product that kills children. That's not a sustainable business model. These companies are just in it to make money by selling cheap garbage to turn a profit, by marketing it to children who are naturally duped into believing anything they see in television advertisements. And it was exactly this type of unscrupulous marketing of toys to children that inspired one writer to conceive an idea for a movie where a toy didn't kill a kid, but instead, the toy killed for a kid. Don Mancini was a film student at UCLA in the 1980s. His father was an advertising executive, and the two didn't have that close of a relationship. In an interview with Mental Floss, Mancini discussed how his strained relationship with his dad and growing up as a gay man in the 1980s created a sense of isolation for him. At the time, the popularity of Cabbage Patch dolls as the must-have toy for all little girls led Hasbro to create a version for little boys called My Buddy to help boys learn how to care for their friends through an unforgettable theme song and adorably misleading images of how much fun a kid could have with this doll. Mancini wrapped up all of his personal goings-ons and the misdeeds of the marketing industry towards children, and he cranked out a screenplay about a single mother raising an only child named Andy. This provided the focus for the idea of his screenplay, where a single mother was raising her only child who receives a doll that would kill anybody that crossed Andy. The original screenplay was titled Batteries Not Included, but was changed to blood buddy. In that script, the actual doll itself was capable of bleeding fake blood. Andy gets the bright idea to mix some of his blood with the doll's blood, and it makes it come to life. Mancini's script was also less transparent to the audience as to whether it was the doll or Andy 
that was actually committing the murders. It was more of a mystery. About this time, film producer David Kirshner was looking to make a suspenseful horror themed movie. He'd recently read Betty Wren Wright's book, The Dollhouse Murders, where dolls come to life inside of a dollhouse and they reenact the murder of two girls' grandparents from decades earlier. Kirshner previously produced the animated film An American Tale, which was extremely successful, and he was in a place where he could pick and choose his next projects. Kirshner had a development deal with Disney, and it was assumed that he would continue to make kid-friendly movies like An American Tale. Instead, Kirshner got his hands on Mancini's script for Blood Buddy and said, this is it. He brought in screenwriter and director Tom Holland, not the guy who played Spider-Man, but the guy who wrote and directed the frighteningly entertaining vampire movie Fright Night. Holland worked with John LaFia, who previously wrote the sci-fi comedy Repo Man, to tweak out some of the story elements of the screenplay. First, LaFia recommended making the character Andy more sympathetic and less full of vengeance. Holland and LaFia also removed the idea of the doll being filled with fake blood as they didn't think parents would purchase such a product for kids. Although dolls that can eat and shit were actual products that parents would buy for their kids, so who knows? A version of the script was passed around to every studio and director they could find, but they all said no. Why? Well, because the movie's premise was <laughs> pretty ridiculous. So rewrites were done to make the movie more believable, and Holland conceived the idea of turning the killer doll into a vessel for a serial killer named Charles Lee Ray using voodoo. The name Charles Lee Ray was an inspired mashup of Charles Manson, Lee Harvey Oswald, and James Earl Ray. Do you know who all those people are, Garrett the Intern? Need you to put down the, the TikToks, Garrett. Need you to read a book, okay? <laughs> Mancini, who wrote the original script, wasn't too thrilled with all the changes being made to his original vision, but there was really nothing that he could do because once the production of the movie began in 1988, the Writers Guild of America was on strike and Mancini had very little to do with the making of the movie. Screenwriter LaFia originally wanted to direct the movie, but he decided to back off this project as it would be his first feature film. So instead, they hired screenwriter Tom Holland, again, not the guy who played Spider-Man, the other one who wrote Psycho 2, and he also uh, was behind that Dabney Coleman, Henry Thomas movie, Cloak and Dagger, that Tom Holland. All right, so Holland gets selected to direct the movie based on his success with Fright Night because Steven Spielberg, that's right, that Steven Spielberg, well, he gave Holland a recommendation to direct this movie because the two had worked together on an episode of Steven Spielberg's television program, Amazing Stories. If you're wondering which episode it was, it was the one where John Cryer plays a horny teenager who uses science potions to make photos of supermodels come to life and then things go sideways. It's like weird science. Anyway, Holland takes his place in the director's chair. And to play the lead detective in the movie, he brought with him Chris Sarandon, who was the main vampire in Fright Night. We last saw Sarandon in Tales from the Crypt, Bordello of Blood, playing an unscrupulous television evangelist. Is there any other kind? I say no. Sarandon was also Prince Humperdinck and the Princess Bride for people who are not into horror movies like Garrett the Intern. Catherine Hicks, who is known by many as the mom on Seventh Heaven, came in to play Andy's mother. Andy himself was played by Alex Vincent. And to take on the role of the murderous Charles Lee Ray was Brad Dorff. Dorff at the time was best known for his role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, during the rehearsals, Dorff did play the doll Chucky. And the idea was that they were going to use an electronic overlay to be the voice of the doll. But that didn't work out. So filmmakers cast Jessica Walter, the mom from Arrested Development, and she was the voice of Mallory Archer, the mother of Sterling Archer on the animated series Archer, that Jessica Walter. Well, they brought her in to be the voice of Chucky the doll. Why would that even be a consideration? Well, film and radio performer Mercedes McCambridge provided the voice of Pazuzu, the demon in the film The Exorcist. So if that classically trained actress could deliver a frightening performance in that movie, then another classically trained actress could do the same for Child's Play. Only that didn't work out. So they brought in actor John Franklin, who was at the time known as Isaac in The Children of the Corn. He was going to voice Chucky, but that didn't work out. So finally, they went back and got Brad Dorff to come in and provide the voice for Chucky the doll, and the rest, as they say, is history. And Dorff has voiced Chucky for every single adaptation 
of the famous murdering doll, Save One, which we will get to momentarily. Production began in early January and was shot in Chicago, where the wind chills reached negative 50 degrees on some days. Good God, that had to suck. It only took two months to shoot. Filmmakers used multiple ways to create the effects of Chucky the doll being alive, including animatronics, puppeteers, forced perspective sets, and child actors. The original cut of the movie was two hours long, and test audience said a no thank you. Now keep in mind, the first cut had Archer's mom as the voice of Chucky. Kirshner said that they needed to cut out a good chunk of all of the Chucky scenes to make the movie more like Jaws or Alien, where the threat of the movie remained more hidden than visible. Holland, our movie's director, he objected to the point that he left production of the film. Ultimately, they removed almost 30 minutes of footage from that original cut, most of which was footage of Chucky the doll. Brad Dorff's voiceover of Chucky was added, and audiences were much more receptive to the run time of 87 minutes. See, that's how you deliver a high concept 1980s horror movie. Get that thing in there under 90 minutes, now you're cooking with gas. Child's Play landed in theaters in April of 1989 and was genuinely well received. Movie critic and amateur hitchhiker Roger Ebert called the movie a cheerfully energetic horror film. <laughs> you don't hear those words put together too often. Critics cited the movie's quick pace, clever use of special effects, and the fact that all of the actors in the film played their roles completely straight. The novelty and gimmick of the story were grounded in performances that made something so ridiculous much more believable. Child's Play called cost about 9 million bucks to make, and it made $44 million. And with numbers like that, what do we get, Gareth the Intern? That's right, sequels. Child's Play produced two sequels, one in 1990 and the other a year later in 1991. And each one leaned more and more into the world of camp and dark humor, ultimately producing a franchise that became more satirical than the original film. In Child's Play 2, Andy lives in a foster home and Chucky returns to murder people. In Child's Play 3, Andy is sent to a military school and Chucky returns to murder people. And Child's Play 3 is the last time that the title Child's Play was used in a sequel title for the franchise, Save One, which we will get to momentarily. The franchise went dormant for about six years and came back in 1998 as a horror comedy with Bride of Chucky. In this movie, Jennifer Tilly plays Chucky's girlfriend, Tiffany, who resurrects the doll Chucky, who then kills his girlfriend Tiffany and then puts her soul into a doll as well. Another six years passed and Seed of Chucky was released in 2004, but not in theaters. This one went straight to video. Uh oh. In this movie, Gentle Glenn is a ventriloquist dummy who is the offspring of Chucky and Tiffany. Oh my God. This movie gets real meta as most horror movie franchises eventually do. And Gentle Glenn, who is alive, hears that Hollywood is making a movie about his dead doll parents. Glenn resurrects Chucky and Tiffany, and they come back to murder people. In 2013, Curse of Chucky was released as a more traditional horror movie with less of the camp and wisecracking jokes. The movie was a direct-to-DVD and home video release, but got a pretty good response from critics by going back to its roots of being a surprisingly scary sequel in the franchise. It should be noted that once the Writers Guild strike was over, Don Mancini, the person who wrote the original screenplay, he returned to give his opinion on the direction of the entire franchise, and Mancini was a key player in every Child's Play or Chucky movie sequel, taking the director's chair for Seed of Chucky, Curse of Chucky, and the 2017 release Cult of Chucky, which was the seventh movie in the franchise, which also received positive reviews from critics for being a more traditional horror movie like its predecessor. Despite Mancini delivering two successful entries into the franchise, owners of the property felt it was time for Child's Play to go in a different direction. Back before Curse of Chucky even started production, there were plans to remake Child's Play. At the time, Platinum Dunes was remaking every horror franchise imaginable with a reboot of the Amityville Horror in 2005, The Hitcher in 2007, Friday the 13th in 2009, and A Nightmare on Elm Street in 2010. The people with the rights to Child's Play knew they were sitting on a ripe opportunity to reboot the iconic murderous doll for a new audience and make a 
stuck or two along the way. One thing led to another, and eventually the whole thing just got canceled, in part because the rights of the original Child Play were owned by two studios, MGM and Universal. Flash forward eight years to 2018, and news breaks that a totally different team is set to reboot the Child's Play franchise. The movie was produced by Seth Graham Smith and David Katzenberg. Smith was the author of the books Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, both of which were adapted to the big screen. Smith also received co-story credits on Tim Burton's adaptation of the horror soap opera Dark Shadows into a feature film. He also worked on the Lego Batman movie. Additionally, he also produced the adaptations of Stephen King's novel It into not one but two successful movies. Now, to write the screenplay for this reimagination of Child's Play, filmmakers pulled in Tyler Burton Smith, who wrote the story for the video game Quantum Break, and not much else. In an interview, Smith cited Steven Spielberg's film E.T., The Extraterrestrial, as a real inspiration for his take on this movie about a doll that <laughs> murders people. Norwegian filmmaker Lars Klevberg was tapped to come in and direct the movie. Klevberg directed the film Polaroid, a horror supernatural thriller about a guy who gets a Polaroid camera that holds dark secrets. And if your picture gets taken with the camera, you meet a tragic ending. Isn't that an episode of The Twilight Zone? Garrett the Intern, did Polaroid rip off the plot of an episode of The Twilight Zone? Probably is the correct answer. Almost everything ripped off a plot of The Twilight Zone one way or the other. <laughs> to play the mother in the movie, filmmakers cast none other than the voice of Grumpy Cat herself, Aubrey Plaza. Plaza rose to notoriety with her performance on the TV sitcom Parks and Rec. Gabriel Bateman was cast to play Andy. Bateman was no stranger to being a child actor in horror films that also included creepy dolls, having appeared in the hit movie Annabelle. He'd also appeared in horror movies that did not have creepy dolls, appearing in the movie Lights Out. Brian Tyree Henry was cast to play Detective Mike Norris. Henry was best known as Papa Boy on the FX comedy drama series Atlanta, for which he received an Emmy nomination for Best Supporting Actor in a comedy series. He also had roles on Boardwalk Empire and How to Get Away with Murder, and he was also on the NBC series This Is Us, the only show that comes with a box of Kleenex tissues. The big question was who would be the voice of Chucky? Seeing as this was a complete reboot with all fresh new faces and voices, Brad Dorff was on the no list. So filmmakers put their heads together and thought long and hard about the perfect actor to voice Chucky, and they went with the first name that somebody shouted out, Mark Hamill! Hamill, known by many as Luke Skywalker from the Star Wars universe, spent many years doing voice work for animated series, including that of the Joker in various adaptations of Batman. Sure, why not him? The movie was shot in Vancouver, Canada, and leveraged the use of both CGI and puppets to make Chucky come to life and eventually murder people. And when Bo gets here in just a few minutes, we will discuss what they did right with this reboot and more importantly, what they did wrong. Critics at the time of the movie's release didn't hate the reboot of Child's Play. They just cited its lack of originality. Although the movie seeks to tap into the theme of digital technology being ever present in our lives, the movie missed the mark when it came to making any sort of true social commentary on this new theme for the franchise. However, some critics did say that they felt that this reboot set the standard for how horror franchises can successfully reinvent something that audiences already know. The movie cost 10 million bucks to make and it made about 45 million dollars. There were talks of a sequel, but that didn't seem to go anywhere, at least at the time of this recording. In 2021, the Sci-Fi Television Network launched a series adaptation titled Chucky, which included creative input from series creators Mancini and Kirshner. The series directly ties to the original film franchise with Brad Dorff returning to voice Charles Lee Ray, AKA Chucky. Jennifer Tilly returned to portray Tiffany, as well as a bunch of other cast members from the original films. The TV series not only continues the story of Chucky murdering people, but it also provided a backstory to Charles Lee Ray and his life of murdering people before, you know, all the voodoo put him inside of a plastic doll. And for horror movie fanatics like Garrett the Intern, this select group of frightening film fans can get all of their questions answered when it comes to the early life of the guy who became Chucky the doll. Garrett the Intern, this is truly a holiday miracle. And speaking of miracles, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to discuss the reason for this season's finale. Ladies and gentlemen, 
guys and dolls, join us for some holiday cheer as we give you the gift of this episode featuring 2019's reimagination of Child's Play. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I am joined by my buddy, who's a real doll, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? Oh, I feel like singing the buddy song with you, Chad. (laughs) You know, I'll tell you what. Here's how I really am. I am excited to talk about a movie for once, because this season has been a bit of a grind. Bo, I'm going to do something that I've never done in the history of Pick 6 movies. Normally, at the end of every season, and this is our season finale of season 22, Mm -hmm. Deja Vu, we rank our movie from best to worst, worst to best. Yes. I'm ranking them right now. Holy shit. This is the best movie of this entire season, and it's a tie for the other five pieces of shit. (laughs) It's tough. This is your best, right? This is the best. So then I think it goes Amityville Horror. Okay. Just because Ryan Reynolds is kind of funny. He does say, what the fuck is wrong with you people? That was pretty funny. Look at your stupid fucking kids. Like, that kind of stuff is really funny. Keep going. So, from there, it's a real question mark. I think it's, God help me, I think it's Rob Zombie's Halloween in third place. The reason is, is because it's an actual vision for a movie. I don't agree with it, and I think it's incredibly distasteful. But it is absolutely the work of someone who had a vision for what he wanted to make, and Okay. So I'm giving him credit just for the artistic endeavor. Then you get to that Elm Street Chainsaw Massacre Friday the 13th remake stretch Mm -hmm. where they're all equally shitty in a lot of ways. Yes. But I'm probably going to go Friday the 13th at number four because it's got more nudity. (laughs) Better kills. Yeah. Number five is probably Chainsaw Massacre just because Arlie Army makes me laugh a couple of times in that. And then Elm Street is bottom of the barrel because it I don't know what that movie offers anybody. It's ugly and boring and I hate it. You're right. It's kind of this movie and everything else. And this movie is imperfect, but it's real watchable. Like it's an entertaining movie. It gets movie. it, man. It lifts enough from the original, but still is its own thing thing it has fun with the gory kills it's not rooted Mm -hmm. in reality so much that you have to take out all of the craziness of what they can do with the movie like this is it a great movie no is it a good movie sure yeah it's better than those other pieces of garbage we watched a million percent it's competently directed yeah the actors are well cast for the most part it's 83 minutes long bo if you cut off the credits oh that's sweet and It's got characters that you actually kind of like. Yeah. Like Andy is a decent kid. He's not an (laughs) asshole. And I mean, he does some asshole things here and there, but he's just a kid. And Detective Mike is kind of a fun character. It was, it was so nice to see somebody in a movie that I'm like, you know what? Here's Mike showing up on screen. I'm genuinely happy about this. (laughs) Let's jump into it. Our movie starts off with the Orion Pictures logo, which always makes me happy. Yeah. And then we get some Braun logo, whatever the hell that is. Our movie kicks in. And this may be the most efficient opening for a movie that we've ever reviewed. And we start off and we meet Henry Caslin. He's the founder of the Caslin Corporation, as played by Tim Matheson. And Tim Matheson, for some reason, seems like a bigger movie star in my eyes than he really is. All because he was the Mm -hmm. elder statesman in Animal House. I mean, and other than that and what, Alan Stanwyck in that original Fletch movie, he didn't really do a whole lot. He did a lot of television and TV movies and stuff. Like, he's had a good career. As sure, an actor. but he's not as big of a movie star as when I saw him in this movie. I was like, ooh, they've got Tim Matheson ooh, money. Ooh, somebody had Tim Matheson money. <laughs> well, look at this. Also, for anybody who's listening and you haven't seen that John Ham Fletch reboot, go watch it. It's fantastic. Spread the word. We need yeah. more John Ham as Fletch. Seconded. Or more people making more Greg Matola yes, Fletch movies. 100%. For sure. All right, so we meet this guy, Henry yeah. Caslin. He's the head of the Caslin Corp. And immediately you surmise, oh, he's going to be our movie center sinister corporate asshole who's up to no good and at the end of the movie he's going to be destroyed by his own creation due to greed lust or one of the other seven deadly sins but no tim matheson as henry caslin he's just here to collect a paycheck but he's 
in this movie less than I've spent talking about him so far. Yeah, and you get the idea that he is the head of this Amazon-like yeah. company. Because as he's talking about Kaslan, you know, you see that they have Roombas and they can uh, do your lights. And, you know, we'll learn later there's like Kaslan cars, which are automated cars and stuff like that. The movie, here's where it gets a little imperfect. But it starts off with this idea of technology being kind of invasive, that there are companies that sort of control everything mm -hmm. in your it's life. It's about being known, understood, and loved. Which I'm like, eh, you know, whenever our company starts talking about that, and they want to pick a few bucks out of your pocket, look out. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was real resistant once upon a time, and, and still am to, to some degree, of that kind of integration with a single company right. but then i end up with a bunch of amazon echoes and stuff like that and the smart lights and that kind of thing and it's real convenient <laughs> and you know i realized like oh shit they got me i i really like being able to schedule the lights when i'm out of town and that kind of thing it to stuff totally works and it's great in this movie they cut to a tv commercial because caslin says that they're introducing your new best friend buddy mm -hmm. and this television commercial is all about this buddy doll one of which will later become known as Chucky in our movie. We need to address what this doll looks like because it is not a copy paste of the original Chucky doll. It is its own thing. Its height is like maybe 24 inches. Mm -hmm. It's got this misshapen oversized head. It's got this redheaded mullet that's inspired by Ziggy Stardust. It's got these blue eyes and a matching glowing index finger like E.T. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wearing mm -hmm. the same clothes as the original but on the front it's embroidered with the word buddy which is not what, what the original doll was called the original doll was a good guy doll so here they've already made some noticeable changes in from the original to this film yeah i think it does look a lot like the my buddy toys from back in the day it definitely has a, a whiff of that it looks like anthony hopkins ventriloquist doll from magic it's it's terrifying. Oh, yeah, but that's good. I think it's intentionally off putting because once it starts talking, its mouth movements at times are slightly asynchronous with the way that it talks to me. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't think any of this was accidental. I think that they intentionally said, we're not just going to do that, but take the idea of that and really reinvent it. We also get our first look in this sequence of the light finger that you mentioned in the intro. There's so much ET in this movie, Bo. The light finger finger his big blue eyes andy wears a red hoodie there's so much et but we'll touch on that as we go forward i loved this tv commercial as they go through all the products that you mentioned like the lights and their version of roomba and the self-driving car and all that at the end of it you see this nuclear family all gather around the buddy doll and the mom is of indian descent and the dad is hispanic the older son is a white kid and the daughter is <laughs> asian uh-huh it's very funny <laughs> Have you met the Benettons? It, and again, very <laughs> intentional and, and, and very clever. The thing that's so efficient about this is that it shows you right off the bat everything this buddy doll is yeah, capable of. Because it controls everything. Right. It's this walking, talking, completely impractical device that you would use to manage your whole house. It introduces the Kaslan car that we get to later. They establish, oh, like this buddy doll imprints upon one yep. person, which explains sort of the threat of the movie and why you know chucky is so obsessed with andy it reminds me a lot of the original poltergeist and i've mentioned this on the show before but that opening scene where you see the dog go through the house and it introduces every member of the family as well as the geography mm -hmm. of the house and you're like oh that is such a smart way to do that and that's kind of how i felt about this of like oh you've totally explained everything the villain is capable of as well as what <laughs> is gonna make him do the things that he does kind of his motivation yeah. as a villain in two minutes yeah. it's so it's so well done it's there's part of the tv commercial where you see the buddy doll sitting in the crib of a newborn infant at night and this doll's pale blue eyes glow in the dark and the doll starts singing <laughs> the buddy song and he goes you are my buddy until the end more than a buddy you're my best friend I love you more than you will ever know. I will never let you go. 
Mm-hmm. What I liked about this song is what I liked about this whole movie. Everything is almost something that you remember because this is essentially a slightly different version of You Are My Sunshine, but not quite. I loved it. Mm-hmm. All of this is familiar enough, but it's unique enough that it doesn't feel 100% derivative of something you've already seen. Like you said, it's familiar, but it's also slightly creepy. Yeah, he looks weird. He's unpleasant to look at. In the original one, Until It Gets Evil, it was a cute little doll. This one is, Mm -hmm. like, you would never buy this thing unless you want to scare somebody. And even the lyrics of the song are vaguely (laughs) threatening if you stop and think about it. Most love songs are. I think if you listen to any love song from, like, the 1950s up until, I don't know, love songs became about, you know, smacking that ass and getting it wet. But they're all Mm -hmm. pretty much manifestos of stalkers. Yeah, it's like the people who got married to every breath you take (laughs) and you're like, eh, I think you're you're missing some of what makes that song work. At the very end of the commercial, they throw out this final legal mumbo jumbo, and it's like, the buddy doll is in no way intended to cause death or harm you or your family. All safeguards are in place to prevent any damage to you, your loved ones, or your property. Pledge of safety void in all 50 states, except the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Grom. Buddy doll will probably kill you. Mm-hmm. Wait, what was that? Nah, just keep moving. We cut away from the Benetton family commercial, and we head to the Caslin factory, colon, Vietnam. According to the text overlay, it's night, and lightning strikes off in the distance. And there's this brilliant... Mm-hmm. Flash, and it's got hints of Frankenstein here, Bo. Yeah, and also the original movie. It ha- it has that same kind of lightning strike as the original. But I also like again, we're we're doing a little bit of social commentary here. Of hey, here's this big megacorp, uh-huh. Caslin, that is outsourcing all of their construction of, and uh, assembly of their products to this just filthy sweatshop oh not since joe banks took us inside the walls of american panacorp have we seen a workplace so filled with misery and gloom i have expected to hear a cover of 16 tons in vietnamese playing as we headed around this horrible place the, so the camera's kind of panning across a bunch of workers who are putting together these buddy dolls we also start the official opening credits here Bo. it does throw out the title child's play remake or whatever uh-huh. and then they start showing us the names of people in the movie but you don't get give a shit because you're watching the movie in the background not the words on the screen which again kudos to you child's play remake i thought you would like that i love this movie and we get to the inciting incident of the film which is this dude who's just staring off into space yeah han that's what i called him and his boss who is cleaner and better dressed than anybody else comes up and just gives him a smack for good measure it's awesome how hard he slaps him (laughs) for having not finished up a buddy doll and also the inefficiencies Uh of how they're making these dolls is hard to understate because every worker in this factory is at his or her own geppetto workshop table these things are being painstakingly put together with tiny bolts and screws and microchips to create this walking talking abomination of technology Mm -hmm. i also like that when the boss slaps him and starts screaming at him he speaks in vietnamese with subtitles like the movie didn't and have them start yeah. yelling English because they were like, uh, you know, Americans, they don't like to read at the movies. Right. After giving him one for flinching, he ends up telling this guy, finish the doll you're working on and then you're fired and get out on the streets where I found you. I both applaud and am disturbed by the fact that this subsidiary of the Caslin Corporation hires people living on the streets to handcraft such delicate pieces of machinery. <laughs> These work tables have like screwdrivers and arc welders and complicated complicated microchips all over the place it looks like a tony stark workshop starter kit so this guy chad Uh decides that he has had enough and if he's going to be fired everybody's going to hell tonight and so he the chip that he's going to put in this buddy doll he just goes through and like turns off why on earth you would ever have these settings in the first place let's go through them language safeguards violence violence inhibitors (laughs) behavior safeguards Uh all of the safety protocols are turned off which to your point why are these here Uh uh-huh There's one that he turns off called violence inhibitors. Like, who put that in? Right. Who thought it was a good idea to have the violence there as an option? I'll tell you who. The U.S. government. Listen up, boys. Yeah, probably right. We might need these to fire in WW3. We need you to be able to flip a switch and have all these little tiny monsters go off and kill whoever is coming after us. It's my military general voice. Yeah, but, well, first, the enemy will be totally taken aback by how adorable the invading army is. And then... When they come up and they give them hug, that's when their penis switchblades pop out. We call it the Garrett. 
current. Oh my god! Because of his dick tattoo. Oh uh, yeah, I I thought it was just a <laughs> you know a tip of the hat to this being his last episode. And uh, hey, Garrett, ear earmuffs. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't be happier. Oh, my God. This guy's been creeping me out for like three months now. He's not listening. Hold on. He wrote me a goodbye letter that's sitting by my computer. It is in an envelope. Bo, at first when I saw it, I thought it was a bribe, like a stack of money. It was so fat. Uh And then I opened it up and it's just folded pages of something that he's written to me. I'm never going to read it. I'm just going to throw it away. I would... Uh, have that checked out there is a hundred percent chance that there is anthrax in that envelope all right garrett we're good so after setting up this buddy doll to be a profanity spewing violence this is machine, basically what our friend ben did when he put all those beers in the coke machines just on a more extreme level you do shit yeah you light a fuse you walk away and you just you know imagine the outcome i'm sure han at least for the next 68 seconds thought it was going to be pretty funny when this doll went ape shit and killed a bunch of people well he thought about it on the way down because what han does is go up to Uh the roof we don't see this there's a cut outside where a couple of guys are outside Uh smoking like you do in vietnam or if you're cool and han comes sailing down from the top of the screen landing on top of this car blowing out the windows the only car in the shot by the way parked there conveniently to keep han's from hitting the ground apparently there's some subtle details in this movie that i really give a thumbs up to like when he comes down and crashes on this car and kills himself in the background is a truck that says caslin corporation like they took the time to put the caslin logo on this truck or at least digitally impose it i also like to think that han knew that his supervisor the one that slapped him around a little bit was at his maximum number of employee suicides for the quarter Mm -hmm. and like one more suicide would send that guy's ass back to the japan a work table (laughs) he'd suffer the slings and arrows of a different tyrannical floor manager (laughs) i'm just like i'm giving my life for the greater good you know they're going to end up putting nets around the bottom of this building (laughs) like they did that iphone factory (laughs) that people kept hopping out of trampolines that's 18 wheelers full of fluffy (laughs) pillows we'll teach you the trampolines are good because it shoots them right back into the building so they can get back to work give them a smack when they come back up you idiot (laughs) we see our buddy doll that han had after he makes it he puts it in a box again because this movie is well made the box that it goes into has a crumpled corner so we'll know it when we Mm -hmm. see it later which this movie does a lot of show not tell yeah i love this movie so much because the previous five were so impossible to watch this movie is well made by well-intended people they know what they're doing and cared and wanted to make a good movie and i argue did or at least a fun movie yeah yeah So we see all of these buddy dolls getting loaded on a truck and we see our buddy doll with the crumpled corner getting tucked. And then here we get our title card of Child's... And we're four minutes Mm -hmm. in. You know, a little late, but I'll allow it because your movie is thoughtfully made. So we cut to this low rent store called Zed Mart. So we're like in Canada, eh? This place looks more like a Dollar General or a Ross for less than it does a Target or Walmart. Like it's very small by comparison. There's maybe three cars in the parking lot. Well, it's... 80% warehouse as we'll learn (laughs) later in the movie everything is in the back but yeah you're right it does look like a shitty Kmart we meet Aubrey Plaza grumpy cat herself and she's working the returns desk at Zed Mart and Aubrey Plaza's like that's Mm -hmm. right it's me Aubrey Plaza returning to pick six movies you haven't seen me since grumpy cat you miss me my dour sense of humor look at me now I'm working at Marshall's or this JC Penny outlet store or whatever shithole this is oh wait here comes a customer I'm going to give him terrible service. That's pretty much what happens. This guy comes up and is like, hey, I got this doll and it's ginger and I hate that. He's really upset <laughs> about the, the color of this doll's hair, which there is a cartoon picture of this doll on the front, back, top, bottom, and sides of the box, plus a see-through window where you can see the doll inside the box as well. All of them have red hair. And that's what she points out. She's like, didn't you see the box? <laughs> and if you missed that... There's a big plastic window right in front of where you can see the hair. Listen up, mister. I don't think you're allowed to use that word. And I was like, wait, is she referring to ginger? Yeah. And I was like, maybe only red-haired people are allowed to use that word. 
So like if you had red hair and I had red hair, we could approach each other on the street and we would say, what's up, my ginger? Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like when the, the songs that uh, from all the Irish rap bands come on yeah. and, you know, they're like, ginger, please. You're like, hey, that's our word. <laughs> I didn't use a hard R. I used, the, the, I left dropped that off. Doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. You don't have yeah. red hair. So this guy, he says, my kid wanted the blonde one, not this one. And he points over at this poster promoting the Buddy 2 doll which comes with augmented reality, whatever that means. And this doll looks like a miniature Aryan. It's got blonde hair. It's all cut short. It's got these big blue eyes. It's also got these arms that are way too long that come down to its knees. It looks like a monkey. I also want to add that the details in this store are pretty good to be dressed up as a Zed Mart because they changed out all of the signs over the aisles to say Zed Mart. I mean, it looks like a miserable place to work and shop and they did a great job making it look like a miserable place to work and shop. Oh, for sure. Aubrey Plaza says, that little blonde abomination, that's the buddy too you purchased the buddy one so take some responsibility for your inability to know what the hell you're buying jackass and so the guy just takes the doll and leaves <laughs> like nothing has been accomplished here he does not get a refund or return it's just like hey sorry about your luck chuck talk to you later we got to aubrey plaza and she's coming home to her apartment where she is creeped out by gabe the super of the building who looks a lot like jack Black, uh -huh. and he's installing some security cameras he's a real creep more on that later and we cut to inside the apartment where we get to meet andy who is 13 years old and at first i thought that aubrey plaza might be his older sister and not his mom and like maybe their parents were dead or something but it's quickly established that aubrey plaza is andy's mother although she looks a lot mm -hmm. younger than her age implies like in real life because she was born in 84 so she was in her 30s when they made this movie which again good casting child's play remake in fact you know somebody says like really it's your your son and she's like yeah i had a busy sweet 16 or whatever or an eventful sweet 16 is the way she puts it they explain that for anyone who's raising an eyebrow at how young she looks and how old her son is even though she's age appropriate the movie still manages to be like no 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 if you look it up it's cool and also if you just listen to her dialogue it's also cool a <laughs> job child's play remake andy sees his mom and he says jeepers mom you look like shit what happened to you aubrey plaza says andy my boy watch your language i told you to unpack these boxes because we just moved in you know what i love this place it's a little love shack where i can build a new life love shack andy love shack andy by the way you haven't unpacked shit what have you been doing all day, you weird little kid? They do have a playful back and forth, Aubrey Plaza and Andy. Yeah. And it ends with her taking Andy's phone to see what kind of deviant internet content he's been checking out. And she looks on it and sees a short video of a buddy doll humping a beach cooler. <laughs> Something, yeah. And then here, it's introduced that Andy has a hearing aid, which only serves to single him out as what, being a little different. It's never addressed that he has an inability to hear that has an impact on the plot or the movie really at all yeah it doesn't factor in the way that you kind of want it to or expect it to i was hoping there was going to be some sort of a copland finale where his inability yeah. to hear would compound the suspense of the situation like that he wouldn't be able to know what was going on around him as effectively if he had more effective hearing yeah the only time it really matters is when chucky speaks directly to him via the the hearing aid yeah like it's a caslin brand hearing aid we also established that like his phone's kind of busted uh he wants a new one for his birthday but aubrey plaza is like i'm working doubles to get you another hearing aid you need to get outside and make some friends look out the window look at those two kids standing under a lamppost at night in the rain go hang out with them i'm sure they're reputable drug dealers or gun dealers or pimps or something it was kind of my first laugh of the movie that wasn't somebody <laughs> getting smacked in the face is her saying look at them steady out in the rain if that looks fun go down there and hang out with them make friends if they have drugs bring some back to me <laughs> right so she promises to give his phone back if he tries to go talk to these kids which he promised to do to you know try to make friends uh, when they move then he just goes sits by himself yeah in front of a coin operated laundromat and just throws rocks at empty liquor bottles the way kids do yeah i threw so many rocks at empty liquor bottles in that vacant lot behind the pizza hut next to the movie theater when i was a kid that was a thing for me yeah uh 
I miss that Pizza Hut. <laughs> they had those uh, sit-down Pac-Man cabinets. And, and all the liquor bottles uh, out back from the employees that did their jobs poorly. Yeah, but that was at a time where like the personal pan pizza would be brought to your table and it felt like an event. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It was like your birthday every day when you went there. Yeah. Oh, look, it's a little pizza just for you. You know, chubby <laughs> me was like, for me? You mean I can't get my own pepperoni and mushroom pizza? You can never get pepperoni and mushroom. You hate mushrooms. We can now, son. Who are you? I'm your dad's friend. Okay. Why are we sitting on the same <laughs> side of the booth? Well, I like to keep warm next to you. Okay. Just put your hand here and eat all you want. That's a great deal. <laughs> Can I get one of them brownies in the pan, too? You can get whatever you like, as long as you keep your hand where it is. Or occasionally <laughs> shuffle it. That's fine. But, all right, anyway, so we go back to Zed Mart. And a woman shows up. She comes in, the this woman, and is like, hey, I bought this buddy doll, and all of a sudden, its eyes start glowing a red, and it started acting real weird. That's crazy. I think there's something wrong with this. <laughs> That's probably not supposed to happen. Aubrey Plaza immediately clocks this as a good gift idea. Reach in the register and take out however much money you think you need to return it. I'm going to take this in the back. I got a brilliant idea for my kid's birthday. So she goes out to the back where Wes, the office manager, uh, is. He works the back dock or something. She's like, hey, this buddy doll got returned. What happens when these things go back? And he's like, well, they put them on the truck and it's got to go back to the castle and come. Company. What if they don't get put on the truck, huh? You know what? I'm taking this one home and I'm not paying for it. And if you got a problem with that, maybe I'll call your wife and tell her you bang Susan in the warehouse. That's what I thought, Wesley. Keep it in your pants. I got a birthday gift to give to my son who has no friends and a hearing aid. Say hi to your wife, Wessie boy. Yeah, I do like the fact that she name checks Susan, by the way. Let's cut to sad sack Andy. He's walking home alone in the rain. And he goes into his uh -huh. apartment. He unlocks the door and he walks in to catch his mother aubrey plaza making out with who, who, who is this guy <laughs> like shane. shane the asshole it's like movie audience shane shane movie audience and it seems to me that it would be more logical if they had introduced this guy as a shitheel earlier in the movie but if the filmmakers did that they might not have come in under 90 minutes so objection overruled counselor i'll allow it no further questions <laughs> yeah and Aubrey Plaza is like, guess what? I'm cooking dinner, Andy. Jeez, Mom, I'm going to go hang out with the kids down the hall. You remember Shane, right? He's that asshole you disapprove of. He's trying to get in my panties. It's a little old place where babies come from. <laughs> So instead of going to meet with these made up friends uh, of his, he just goes to the hallway and starts playing games yeah, on his or phone. At pornography. And this is where we meet Detective yeah. Mike, the guy who comes to visit and have dinner with his mom who lives yeah. in the building. Detective Mike is very funny because he's like, hey, what are you, like a fourth floor hobo or something? What's your name, Andy? Right? You moved him to 401? In this scene, it is a perfect example of how this movie does such a good job of show, not tell. Because when Mike and Andy are talking, Detective Mike kind of casually moves his jacket and Andy sees that Mike has a badge on his belt, which Detective Mike quickly covers up. And their back and forth is very subtle. You know, a lesser film would have had Detective Mike say like, hey, I'm Mike. I'm a detective i've been on the force five years you know but it's just more thoughtful the way that this is revealed mm -hmm. to characters in the movie and to us i totally agree and yeah and even him saying like hey i'm you know having dinner with my mom and she constantly disapproves and that kind of thing it's it's all very well done he says to andy hey if you want since you're all alone out here in the hallway you can maybe come over and you could join us for dinner i could use the backup because my mom is and detective mike does the guzzle booze motion <laughs> <laughs> with his hands and goes cross-eyed detective mike's mom is a drunk and he's telling this strange kid in the hallway about it i'm like i love detective mike uh-huh <laughs> and aubrey plaza shows up what the hell is this who the hell are you why the hell am i shouting detective mike has a really funny bit here where he's like yeah i'm sorry man we've been getting complaints about people hanging out in the hallway throwing parties and dealing drugs in the hall <laughs> peddling booze selling guns human trafficking i'm exaggerating of course yeah but you got a good kid here all right i'm detective mike i've established myself as a non-threatening person for you and more importantly the audience you can trust me. Aubrey Plaza, seeing that her son did not go out to friends and was just uh. ditching her, is like, 
Why didn't you come inside and eat dinner with me and Shane? Jeez, Mom, I just hate Shane. He's a real asshole. We do see Detective Mike's mom. She opens up the door and she's like, Detective Mike, get in here and make me dinner. It's not going to cook itself, you lousy, no good son of a bitch. And he's like, all right, Ma. So he goes off. And Aubrey Plaza is like, come on back in the apartment. I've got a surprise for you. Look, I know that you hate me, but I decided that I was going to get you something special to bribe your love. It's an early birthday present. He he opens it up and obviously it's the buddy doll right and he's like jeez mom this is nice and all but it's kind of for little kids what do you mean it's the doll you're obsessed about you're always looking at those video memes with this little doll humping a tree and sticking a hot dog in it out its mouth what are you talking about you can make it fuck all kinds of things <laughs> you know mom i just watch those because i think they're funny and i make fun of it no shit! I think it's stupid too! Let's make fun of it together, alright? You know me, I'm Aubrey Plaza. My wit and humor and sarcasm is ironic and dry. Sometimes meta. Let's fire up this doll and rag on it. Like a couple of middle-aged white guys with a movie podcast. We'll do voices and shit. Remember, this doll's stolen. Uh, I mean refurbished. So it may not work properly. And so Andy kind of hooks it up to his phone. Mm. And it mm. wakes up. And you immediately see it imprinting on Andy. Which we learn from the opening bit. That like that's how it, it connects to a single person. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> Hi, are you my new best f f f f f friend? And Andy's like, Jeepers, I guess so. And then it scans his face to connect with him. And the doll says, what's your name? And Andy says, Andy, sup? And the doll says, hi, Andy, sup? And you're like, oh, this is going to be like some Abbott and Costello bit. But it doesn't really go anywhere. I think it's only mentioned once or twice more. Yeah, and like Aubrey Plaza calls him Andy, sup one time yeah. and that kind of thing. But he asked for a name. What's my name? Andy says... Han Solo, that's what it is. And the doll says, Chucky, I like that name. That's not even close. <laughs> Which, how amazing right. would this movie be if the name of the murdering doll was Han Solo? Especially with Mark Hamill playing <laughs> Han Solo. With hindsight, I almost wish they had named the doll Chucky. And I get why they did. But if they'd just given it a different name, it really would have broken away from all of the other films. I don't disagree, but I do kind of like the fact that that is the one nod, especially because it's so clearly like, hey, I want you to be named Han Solo. You mean Chucky? <laughs> And it's like, okay, I get it. That's that's kind of fun. Aubrey Plaza tells him like, hey, if to get him to work with all the TV and stuff, you got to seek up to the cloud. He tries to hook it up, but it doesn't work. And Aubrey Plaza says, ah, this doll's a piece of shit. I'm going to take it back to the store and get my no money back. Sorry, kiddo. I suck as a mom. But you and I are best friends, right, Andy? And Aubrey Plaza and her son Andy hug. And Chucky watches the two embrace. Now, Chucky in this movie absorbs everything around him like a sponge and this was a theme that was introduced into the movie by the film's director who saw how his own very young children just absorbed everything that he did both good and bad again a new yeah. idea as opposed to the original which was just you know a murdering asshole whose voodoo <laughs> put him in a doll to go exact revenge this movie has a lot more character development and has more in common with like single white female or i don't want to say fatal attraction because andy doesn't have sex with chucky but it is a relationship between he and this doll that the doll's intentions are well-meaning they just end up being executed in a very unwell meaning way right because there's no inhibitor it just goes to the illogical extreme right. and i i agree i think there are so many times where you're like i kind of feel bad for chucky in moments in this movie yeah i can't say that was the case for all the other killers and her other remakes right like especially that elm street one where they want you to sympathize with a child molester for a minute no thank you I will not do that. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a terrible thing to ask Come an on. audience to do. Come but on. Child molester? Come on. He's not a bad guy. You make a compelling argument, sir, but the answer is still a hard no. Right. I'm. That's a, a pass for me. That's a no for <laughs> I'm me. I'm going to pencil you down as a maybe. Please don't. <laughs> as long as you leave, that's fine. <laughs> So Andy takes his Chucky doll by the hand and he walks him toward his bedroom. 
And Andy introduces Chucky to their cat. He says, Jeepers, that's our cat. His name is Mickey Rooney. He's a real dick. And Chucky says, he's a dick. And Andy is taken aback that the doll is using the word dick. Also, I mentioned at the beginning of this that the screenwriter of this film was inspired by Steven Spielberg's masterpiece, E.T. That's putting it lightly. Like, not since Mac and me have I seen a movie so blatantly rip off E.T. for its own personal gain. And this scene is emblematic of that because when Andy takes Chucky into his his room he shows him all of his toys and his drawings which are these mashups of buddy cops there's dracula and robin hood and zorro and medusa but all of this is completely lifted from et when elliot takes et into his room and shows him his star wars toys and how the planets work and all of that i like it when he shows chucky his mashups like geez look at the it's zorro medusa i don't know it's kind of lame chucky is like oh no it's really good and he says, geez, pity compliments from a talking doll. That's my life. <laughs> and he turns the page of his sketchbook and we get a quick shot of a photograph of what I assumed was Aubrey Plaza and his dad who may be dead or divorced. And then Andy immediately closes the sketchbook and says, that's enough for tonight. So you're like, oh, you know, there was a dad or father figure. There's mm-hmm. something going on here, which we don't really dive into that, but that's fine. It just shows that the kid is sort of dealing with some stuff. From Andy's point of view, it's just the person who was my father isn't gone now also this whole scene has a musical score that is a slowed down version of the buddy theme song but it sounds like it's being played on that children's pianosaurus toy it's this clunky (laughs) like blink 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 and it's almost haunting and it really has a playful weirdness to it that really works in my opinion yeah it's like the eels decided to play the chucky theme but and before he goes to bed chucky asks andy do you want me to sing the buddy song and he's like uh you know you don't have to you are my buddy (laughs) Until the oh, end. all right. I guess you're gonna do we're it gonna anyway. More than a buddy. No, really, we're good. You're oh. my best bu- 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 friend. You're like, oh, this doll's fucked up. It goes all out of sorts for a moment, and its loving blue eyes quickly flash to red, off and on. And you're like, oh, this is gonna get good. And then Andy wakes up in the middle of the night with this doll staring it's at terrifying, him. Terrifying, isn't it? And he's like, so is it time to play now? <laughs> and he's like, ah. <laughs> And finally, it's like, no, listen, Jeepers, I I know you want to play, but now's not the right time. You're creeping me out. And then Chucky whispers, you're my best friend. And he's like, ugh, this is the worst. I'm going to go to sleep now. I'll see you in the morning. And then he just starts quietly singing the buddy song again. (laughs) But it's not with malice. It's so innocent and kind and just wanting Andy's love or connection that Andy ain't given back. It is unrequited love. For sure at this point. (laughs) And... That, it, but all right so the next morning we get a little bit of a montage where you know things are starting to warm up a little bit like andy is brushing his teeth and chucky is making the same motion and then we see andy make uh-huh. a sandwich and stab the knife into the cutting board and chucky makes that motion too to let you know like oh knife knives go yeah. into things got it but it's accompanied with that pianosaurus clunky version of the chucky song and has this sweetness that's also off kiltered a little bit and then there's another legitimate laugh where andy is on his way out the door uh for mm-hmm. school wearing his et brand red hoodie that he wears for the rest of the movie right and chucky's like wait just a second andy you almost forgot your science book and he's holding a roll of toilet paper <laughs> i love this movie and andy is like <laughs> it, it's a really good gag because he, he goes Jeez, Chucky, this isn't a science book, and neither is any of that stuff. And you get the cut to all the shit that this doll has brought this kid as a, quote, science book. And it's like scissors, a Viking helmet. It's just random shit. And it's very funny. And to your point earlier, the doll giving a child a science book was something that they mentioned in that original television commercial. Again, yeah. it's stitching together all of the things we see at the beginning, both benign and much more <laughs> unbenign later on. That is, you're like, they were paying attention. It's so refreshing to watch a movie that is <laughs> just such a money grab. Anyway. So when he comes home from school, which is the very 
very next uh-huh. scene, he finds Chucky waiting for him at the door while Aubrey Plaza and Shane are watching TV. Uh, he's in there drinking beer and she's laying on his yeah. chest. He's got his feet with his shoes on on the table. Shane, have some respect. Chucky's like, I made you a present. And it's just a broken popsicle stick with a ribbon poorly tied to it. It's- awesome it's very good he's like thanks i guess chucky yeah, shane gives him a shh because he's like anxiously awaiting the judge judy verdict or something right just being a, an <laughs> asshole outside the apartment chucky listens to andy complain about like i hate shane so much he's the worst he's just gonna leave like everybody else does anyway and chucky's like not me i'll never leave and you're like, oh, okay. I like, I understand now that this isn't the James Earl Ray Chucky. This is again, they're like, you understand Ch- Chucky's motivation in this, which is, I love this person so much, I will do literally anything they ask me, even if I'm misinterpreting what they're asking me. Yeah. Chucky hugs Andy here, and Chucky says, "Are we having fun now?" Andy says yeah i guess and then we get more of a montage of andy and chucky bonding and they're playing a board game and andy drops one of the game pieces on the ground and it lands next to mickey rooney the cat and andy reaches to pick it up and the cat scratches andy's hand pretty bad there's a lot of blood and chucky sees this andy leaves to get a band-aid and chucky's eyes go from big blue orbs of friendliness to red circles of hate you're like "Uh (laughs) uh-oh When Andy comes back in the room, he finds Chucky strangling this cat. And all I could think was, Bo loves this. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Because the cat just... It's a real Bart Simpson, Homer Simpson of like, why I'm gonna... Oh, totally. And Andy ends up like grabbing the cat away from Chucky. He's like, geez, Chucky, you can't hurt people or cats. Well, maybe Shane, but definitely nobody else. (laughs) Shane, right on time, shows up at the door is like, hey, that cat's freaking out. Better clean up this fucking room, kid. (laughs) Andy looks back at Chucky and he says, you know what, Chucky? You could probably hurt that guy. Do whatever you want to him. He's a real piece of shit. You know what? That gives me an idea. So Andy takes Chucky out in the hallway and he tries to teach Chucky how to look mean and scary and angry so that they can fright Shane. And this is the most intentionally funny moment of the movie as this doll contorts its face in the most (laughs) freakish way ways to look frightening and it fails on every front and it is a delight and right on time the other kids uh, of the movie pug and phelan show up walking pug's dog andy's hearing aid gives some feedback and pug is like wow that's fucking loud and chucky goes oh yeah that's fucking loud and immediately the kids are like wait a second did your doll just use profanity because that's awesome Pug looks like Francis from Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Or Buzz from Home Alone. Yeah, he's cut from that cloth. And then Phelan is just this thin, redheaded teenage girl. So that they're they're distinguishing characters. What I like about this scene is Phelan saying like, hey, Dull shouldn't be able to do that. That's how every like Robot Apocalypse movie starts. Sure, they address it. Right. And then Andy says, well, I'm trying to teach the doll to be scary because I want him to freak out but not kill my mom's boyfriend, Shane, who's an asshole. And these two new kids in our movie are totally on board. Because Andy says like, uh... You know, I guess it's kind of lame. And Pug is like, no, it is not. And we are doing it right now. So we cut to Shane going to get another beer from the fridge. Pick me one way up there. And Chucky kind of shows up to freak him out, but he doesn't kill him a little bit. And then the next day we cut to Pug and Phelan. They just arrive at Andy and Aubrey Plaza's apartment. Aubrey Plaza answers the door. She says, who the hell are you? And Pug just walks in and says, we're here for Andy. Let's move, dick turd. (laughs) He calls him a dick turd. There is no way any self-respecting Aubrey Plaza is going to let this happen in her house. And on their way out, Pug is like, God, Andy, your mom's hot. He says, your sister's hot. And he's like, gee, that's my mom. And he's like, your mom? That's even hotter. Like, I totally smashed that. Right. I was wanting Pug to end up on Chucky's enemies list so badly. But spoilers, Pug lives to the end of the movie. But he deserves to die. He's a real 
jerk off. He is a bit of a jerk, but so we get a glimpse of the maintenance guy fixing this vending machine while uh, the kids are kind of watching mm-hmm. and they get Chucky to swipe a bunch of chips from the tray that he's pulled out of the vending machine. And so outside, you know, the kids are all eating their ill gotten chips and one of the kids tries to get Chucky to stab this stuffed unicorn and say, <laughs> he tells him like, stab it and say, this is for Tupac. Yeah, but the kids who are telling him to stab the unicorn aren't Pug or Phelan. They're like other bad dudes from the courtyard. I think one of them is Omar, who we we it, it is more of a thing later, yeah. and some of those kids. But when he says this is for Tupac, I was like, wait a minute, Tupac died in 1996. That was like 25 years before this movie came out. He could have just as easily said, this is for Gene Kelly, or this is for George Burns, two people who also died in the year 1996. Did Tupac really die, Chad? Yeah, George Burns and Gene Kelly killed him. Oh. Wow. <laughs> and then they murdered each other. So as Detective Mike is walking by, one of the kids is like, Pug, it's Pug. <laughs> yeah. All right, Pug. He goes, Narc alert. <laughs> and Chucky starts repeating, Narc alert, Narc alert. And <laughs> while my Detective Mike walks by, he just goes, fucking millennials. Yeah, which by the way, Detective Mike, none of these kids are millennials. Millennials are currently yeah. between the ages of 26 and 40. 41 these kids are gen z yeah absolutely we cut to andy and pug and phelan and they're watching the texas chainsaw massacre 2 with chucky yeah they are and they're laughing at how ridiculous this movie is because it is an intentionally ridiculous movie and chucky's watching all of the horror unfold on the screen and he also looks over to see these three teenagers just hee-hawing and slapping their knees enjoying the hell out of this movie as you and i did as teenagers Mm -hmm. but at this moment chucky's eyes flash from blue to red again it's a well-made movie so Mm -hmm. We cut to Chucky in the kitchen. He pushes a chair up to the counter and he grabs a knife from the wooden cutlery holder and he walks back into the room where these teenagers are hanging out with the knife drawn, repeating a line from Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is heads up, bitch. And Chucky just starts lurching towards Pug with this knife because you're like, of course, that's who you're going to kill of these three. But then Andy jumps in to stop Chucky from stabbing Pug. And during the scuffle, Chucky cuts Andy's arm a little bit. This leads to much guilt so that later Chucky is just sitting in the dark and is like, I'm really sorry about that, Andy. I thought it would make you happy. You liked it when you saw it in the movie. I thought if I did it in real life, you'd enjoy it even more. Kind of like the way Shane likes to watch pornography and Aubrey Plaza does the things in the movie to make him happy. Speaking of, we cut to a scene with Aubrey Plaza and Shane, the asshole. Uh-huh. Aubrey Plaza is making cookies and Shane's like, nope, that's all right, babe. Uh, how about you just grab me another beer? <laughs> While he's watching the football game, like it's the most stereotypical typical asshole move chucky shows up and starts playing an audio recording of andy saying from earlier in the movie shane's such an asshole and chucky plays it over and over shane does not care for this bow but aubrey plaza Mm -hmm. laughs she's like that's hilarious this doll's playing sounds of my son calling you an asshole aubrey plaza though is about to put the hammer down because uh andy's in his bedroom and he's like i didn't jeez mom i didn't make chucky say anything at all and aubrey plaza is like all right you only get one hour a day with this thing i'm putting them in the closet yeah she puts him in this little waist high cupboard with glass panels on the front so chucky's being yeah. locked up because aubrey plaza says look this doll's freaking out mickey rooney the cat we gotta keep the doll away from the cat and so late at night after she locks this thing up we see andy kind of looking out his bedroom door Uh you see the cupboard bang as chucky is kind of fighting against it and then the next day when he gets home from school we see that like this glass pane has been busted out of the cupboard and chucky's out he's on the loose and he looks a little scared because you know the last time we saw him he had a knife in his hand right well and he has every reason to be chad there's also a really good moment here when andy goes over to the cupboard and he opens it to kind of inspect what's going on the side of the door that doesn't have the broken glass turns and you see a reflection of chucky standing in the kitchen but it's very subtle Mm -hmm. the way that it's framed up and again you're like oh these people know what they're doing just keep doing more of it this is pretty good and this doll is standing over the bloody body of mickey rooney the cat Mm -hmm. 
And Andy's like, jeepers, Chucky, what'd you do that for? And Chucky is like, well, Mickey Rooney made you unhappy. And now we can play together more. And Chucky starts playing audio of Andy saying how sick he is of the cat. Which, in fairness, is something that every cat owner says on a weekly basis. <laughs> Right, like this little vomiting and, you know, dead animals in your house or ripped up furniture. I swear I'm so sick of this cat. To hide this crime. Yes. Andy just dumps the body into this box, takes it to the garbage chute. It is like sayonara, Mickey Rooney. That's right. Mickey Rooney is out of our movie. But then Andy wakes up that night and sees Chucky standing in the corner, staring back at Andy as we hear quiet audio of Mickey Rooney the cat being killed. Yeah. Chucky is is now really expressing signs of jealousy and anger and hate. I think this is one of the creepiest moments that, like, legitimately frightening is a doll standing in the corner of your room in the dark playing the sounds of a cat dying. It is (laughs) unpleasant. The next day, Andy comes home from school to find Chucky sitting on the couch, like the back of the couch, waiting for Andy. And Chucky's legs are crossed at the knees, and (laughs) Chucky has both of his hands resting on his top leg. And there is a look on this doll's face that says, come in, we need to talk. We both said and did some things yesterday we both regret. But let's let bygones be bygones. We'll start anew. This is not good. Another fairly subtle touch here is when Shane enters the room, he's buckling his belt. Yeah. He's tucking in his pants when Aubrey Plaza comes in. She's like, hey, we're ordering pizza. I just got fucked. (laughs) And he says, I'm going to Pugs. And Aubrey Plaza walks over to Chucky and she stares at the doll and she kind of thumps it on. She's like, what are you looking at, you weird looking doll plastic thing that I stole off the back of a truck? And Chucky just sits there quietly. And then Sheen the Mm -hmm. asshole, he goes into the bathroom to take a piss after drinking all of Aubrey Plaza's beer. And somehow he completely missed the fact that Chucky is now sitting on a towel rack beside the toilet. And Shane looks over and he's like, oh, shit. And he just like sprays pee everywhere that Aubrey Plaza will clearly be the one cleaning up a few hours later. Yeah, he does. In the movie, you see the flash of piss just go everywhere (laughs) for a second. It's really funny. Chucky starts playing audio of Andy calling Shane an asshole. So Shane busts into Andy's room. And he's like, here's your fucking doll. And he says, you got a problem with me, kid? Be a man and say it. And he kind of gets up in this kid's face. Don't use your doll to call me an asshole. You know, here, let me hear it out of your mouth. And he shuts the right. door and pushes Andy down on the bed. And I'm like, oh, shit. Right. And there is nothing better than if you've got like a sensitive child than to start screaming at him and getting up in his face. Go ahead. Say it to my face. It's what I thought. You're a weak little 13 year old boy afraid to stand up to a grown goddamn man who's twice your size full of alcohol and rage typical kid scared of an adult with all the power <laughs> pussy and so he leaves and andy is like god chucky i just hate him so much i wish shane would leave me alone <sighs> and chucky's eyes do that shift to red uh-huh. and he kind of gets an evil grin on his face like oh i think i've got the green <laughs> light to get up to some business Shane leaves the apartment and he goes out into the hallway and Aubrey Plaza follows him and they have a little back and forth about how Aubrey Plaza needs to be raising her kid and Detective Mike is there and he's kind of eavesdropping. That's one of the things that he does. So Shane leaves and he goes out and he climbs in his work truck and he gets on his mobile phone. He's having a separate argument with somebody that we don't know who that is yet and we hear a small rumble the thump the thump in the back of the truck as if a small doll just climbed (laughs) onto this vehicle. (laughs) Shane arrives at his home and the movie also shows us that he is married <laughs> with two daughters yeah and he reaches the sun visor pulls it down his wedding ring falls off he pops it on his finger so when he's not getting drunk and having sex with aubrey plaza he's dealing with his first wife and these two kids right and he seems happy to see the kids less so his wife but then he makes the decision to go remove christmas lights that are on the outside of their house that are also turned on i was a little confused like so is this movie set at christmas or is he just the kind of guy who leaves his lights up year round and this is like the action of a man who does not want another letter from the hoa it's probably more the latter like i don't think he would do this unless he had to there's no better time to take down christmas lights than at night in the dark when you're drunk 
drunk. That's also the time you take down lights is when you're drunk and the in the dark late at night kind of follows. <laughs> like he's been drinking all day and now it's just like, I'm so sick and tired of dealing with these kids and that bitch. I'm going to go outside and take care of these lights, I think. I'm going to take a couple of road beers with me too. Put one in my back pocket. Put one in my other back pocket. Put one on my sleeve. One in my hand. One in my hat. And one in my boot. That's good. So when he climbs up on this ladder, it shakes a little bit and he goes, get out of here, raccoons. And you're like, wait a second. Are, are you being assaulted by raccoons to that degree on the regular that you're like, are they moving the ladder again? He just watched the great outdoors at Aubrey Plaza's place. It's fresh on his mind. <laughs> I guess so. And then the ladder is properly kicked out from under him. Yeah. And he falls to the ground, Chad, landing on both feet which results in compound fractures of both shins yes while he is covered in christmas lights it is awesome look how garrett has given us two thumbs up look how happy he is at this <laughs> i'm with you garrett thumbs up for me too that was that was awesome and he lets out this shriek like ah! right? and he, you see his kids watching tv <laughs> or something and just not paying any attention to him which is great there's a little bit of a i don't know a message here because you do see the daughters inside with their headphones on on their ipads and just that they're so absorbed in technology they cannot hear their father's paralyzing pain feet away mm -hmm. and when he falls we see that he has a watermelon patch in his backyard uh -huh. as well which that was a little odd but it'll come into play a bit later so Shane, who also dropped his phone, he starts clawing his way over towards the illumination of his cell phone to arguably call for help to deal with his double compound fracture of the shins. <laughs> <laughs> About this time, there's some scus, 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 into the bushes, and then a rototiller gets turned on by a tiny Chucky shaped hand. Yeah. And also, we forgot to mention Shane is wrapped up in Christmas lights because when he fell, they got spun around his body. And then there's this long trail of Christmas lights that, when the rototiller gets turned on in the middle of the night, starts chomping up the Christmas lights as it pulls its way towards Shane. It's terrific. So he's trying to get to the phone, keep away from the tiller and then chucky jumps on his chest with a knife and says it's tickle time nobody hurts my buddy this is for tupac and gene kelly and george woods he starts slicing this guy but not before the tiller hits this guy's head and takes off the top it scalps him and flings it through the air and his scalp lands on the head of a garden gnome statue uh-huh and then chucky just continues murdering shane the asshole off camera with squishy stabbing sound it's all great i like everything about what's happening here and this is how you kill people in a slasher movie like this it's all ridiculous it's over the mm -hmm. top it's not like the other movies that we watch that grounded this stuff in reality that was trying to make it so miserable and visceral you know i get that those other remakes were trying to do something different but this for me is a hell of a lot more fun absolutely and that's what this movie wants you to do like it's got some things that it's commenting on sociopolitically which is interesting to say also something nice to see in these movies but that is secondary to this is a fun story and you're here to have a good time in a weird way it's kind of like the original chainsaw massacre yeah for sure this is as gleefully over the top as texas chainsaw massacre at times yeah trying to say a little something and making you squirm in your seat and wince your eyes. But at the same time, it's like, this is all ridiculous and over the top. I'm not dealing with a guy who's having sex with children. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> detective Mike and another detective show up on this crime scene where they find Shane and we see his face is totally gone now. His head is just skeleton and muscle. Like, not only is his scalp gone, his face face is gone yeah and mike sees his id and again doesn't say hey i recognize this guy it's just the audience is given credit for knowing like oh detective mike saw him and aubrey plaza arguing in the hallway and mike sees the id and kind of rolls his eyes like oh i know who this guy is did you like what his id was because it wasn't his driver's license it was his gym membership <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then detective mike has a good line here where he says White guy dead in a watermelon patch. Poetic. Is that poetic? Kinda. Ironic, perhaps? I just didn't know if it was poetic. The next day, Andy wakes up, and he gives it a... 
Ugh, jeepers, what a night I had sleeping. Well, time to go into the other room and get ready to start my day. And he walks out of his bedroom and passed. <laughs> A bloody watermelon <laughs> that is wearing the skinned face of Shane the asshole. Uh-huh. And it has his eyes plugged into the sockets and his teeth. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's horrifying. It's but it's really funny because it's one of those moments where like andy walks by it and it's like wait a second and then comes rushing back in the room to find this thing and the words out of his mouth when he comes back in are what the fuck which truer <laughs> words have never been spoken in a movie yeah and chucky's off to the side and chucky says now we can play again i'd do anything for you my best bu -bu -bu buddy did we also point out that there is a bow on top of this thing as if it is a <laughs> gift to this child I just envisioned little Chucky after he cut off his face and strapped it with the melon. He walked however many miles back to Andy and Aubrey Plaza's apartment. Just singing the, you are my bud. <laughs> right. <laughs> Please this punch with himself. Sure. <laughs> He's going to love this. When Andy continues to freak out, he plays the recording of Andy saying, I just want Shane to leave us alone. And Andy loses his shit, <laughs> as you would imagine, right? He locks Chucky in a cabinet. He calls up Phelan and Pug. Yeah. And he's like, guys, you got to come see this. And Pug immediately <laughs> vomits <laughs> upon seeing this thing. And Andy's freaking out. Naturally so. Yeah. And Andy's like, oh, should I call the cops? And Phelan's like, and what? Tell him that your doll cut off the face of your mom's boyfriend who you hate yeah and strapped it to a watermelon no this is not good advice <laughs> we gotta hide the evidence phelan kind of looks pointedly at some wrapping paper it's the wrapping paper that the doll was originally given to andy by his mom again a nice touch of like why does he have wrapping paper in his room oh because that's right. the wrapping paper from the buddy doll anyway very nice again well done child's play remake and anyway so the kids leave with this <laughs> watermelon face in tow and Aubrey Plaza stops him and is like hey wait a second what do you got there Andy and he's like uh it's a present for Doreen Detective Mike's mom down the hall and Aubrey Plaza's like oh really well let's go deliver it then so Aubrey Plaza and Andy they go down the hall to Detective Mike's mama's house and they knock on the door and she's like she's like oh lord how can I help you all and she's like yes it's my son Andy he's got a gift for you isn't that right Andy and Andy He's like, oh, yeah, it's for all of the wink, wink, homework help you've wink, been giving me wink, wink, over wink, the last wink, week, wink, wink. And this older woman, she sees that Andy's in a pinch. And she's like, oh, Lord, Andy is a delight. Thank you for the present. And Andy's like, whoa, 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 uh, don't open it till next week on my birthday. Because that's how we do things in our house. We give other people presents and then you open it on my birthday next week. And she's like, okay. Her response is, what a strange and thoughtful gift. <laughs> Yeah, so he's covered until next Friday in theory. And he goes to his room and he opens up the closet and he's brandishing a hammer. And inside he finds Chucky sitting there with a knife. Uh-huh. And Chucky says, you left me in the closet. I don't like the closet. You're my best buddy. I just want to be friends. And Andy says, give me the knife and you and I can go play. Okay, Chucky? It's a real hoid accident kind of moment. Of, you know, you got the knife. I got the hammer. Come on, little doll. We're going to have a little slammer. I'm a jealous man. I'm sorry. Andy walks Chucky into another room, and the movie turns into a Scorsese film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like layla starts playing and pug jumps out and clocks chucky in the head with a frying pan phelan jumps in on the action just beating the hell out of this doll andy gets in on the action and they just start ripping this doll piece by piece the whole time chucky is screaming out why andy i thought we were best friends and phelan reach in and rips out this heart power medallion again which looks like iron man a hundred percent an iron man core yeah they take the pieces of this doll and they dump it down the trash chute to go spend eternity with mickey rooney the cat and they kind of resolve like we will never speak of this again enter building super and all-around pervert gabe who goes into the trash and he finds the doll and he decides to hook it up to a diehard battery and give a little jump start and it's here that we see that gabe the building super pervert is a creep because he has all of these monitors that are showing footage from residents of the building with cameras that he's hidden inside all of the apartments. 
Chucky is there and Chucky can see what's going on as well. When he finds this deactivated buddy doll, his immediate thought is I'm going to repair this and flip it on eBay. Yeah. Cause he says, I'm going to make a pretty penny on resale on this thing. And he grabs this drill while Chucky is watching. And he says, let's open you up. See what we're dealing with. I was so glad he didn't have sex with this doll. If we had been over in Rob Zombie's child's play or whoever the hell was behind that nightmare on Elm street, this dude would have like dropped his pants and we would have cut away and just felt disgusted. But in this case, he's just going to take him apart. Rob Zombie's child's play definitely would have had somebody having sex with this doll or the doll having sex with somebody else, or maybe both up in Aubrey Plaza's apartment, detective Mike and his partner, they show up and they're sharing the bad news that Shane, the asshole is dead. And then the worst news that he had a wife and two daughters. It's kind of funny because in this scene, Shane, face and eyeballs and teeth are just like around the corner strapped to a watermelon <laughs> <laughs> right is that poetic am i using that right here i don't know aubrey plaza is taken to another room to you know talk about this horrible murder and mike is just being a decent dude yeah. here andy shows up and mike's like hey we're just asking your mom some routine questions no big deal and andy's like immediately sweating bullets like he's striker landing that plane and he's like like oh <laughs> like immediate diarrhea diarrhea of the cops are here don't worry about it your mom's not gonna be under arrest cut to aubrey plaza sitting on the floor of the kitchen polishing off a bottle of red wine there's no good men in the world they're all gay or shame the assholes or their faces are cut off andy give me the coupons for dominoes i'm at our uh, pizza mushrooms and pepperoni the most special jeez mom is this gonna be another night where you just drink wine on the floor is it a day that ends in a y <laughs> that's my joke so andy then decides he's gonna go to detective mike's for dinner yeah, he's like, i gotta get that mel and head back and also get away from my mom because she's an angry drunk we also see down in the basement gabe the pervert yeah and chucky is watching andy on the surveillance camera which is inside detective mike's mom's house he's showing her how to use the caslin car app yeah. which will come into play in a minute she says andy you are my new best friend for showing me this and chucky sees this going on and you know in that little dull mind of his he's like I'm going to have to kill her. Bolts of the shit. I'm Andy's best friend. Mike sees this watermelon face in wrapping paper and picks it up and is like, oh, where did this come from? And his mom is like, well, somebody gave me a present and we know it wasn't you. And Mike just has his hand on this thing and is kind of tapping it as he's talking to Andy and talk about sweating bullets. Andy is like, holy shit, he's about to find out <laughs> that there is a head in his hand. It's suspenseful. It's really well done. As soon as Detective Mike gets up to go to the kitchen with his mom, Andy grabs this thing and hauls ass he's gone to the garbage chute where he is dumping every body <laughs> right now <laughs> it's a real jeffrey Dahmer situation <laughs> and he just chucks this thing down the garbage chute as well uh-huh and then we cut down to the basement where gabe our pervert has chucky strapped down and this dude like sniffs the chucky clothes that he's given him yeah he orders a fresh set and he gives him a real sniff all right again i'll allow it because gabe's a pervert and gabe's about to die for being a pervert he is not a good dude who is a hero of the no, film the movie's not asking us to side with the pervert who sniffs doll clothes so he <laughs> he sniffs the doll clothes puts in a new power supply for chucky and he's like oh time to put you on ebay <laughs> but not before watching aubrey plaza on a hidden camera in her bathroom get into the shower but it's not a nude aubrey plaza she's a class act she's not going to show that while he's watching Watching this, Chucky gets up off the table behind uh -huh. him. The lights go out. Gabe is like, hey, Caslin, system reboot. <laughs> All of the Caslin products are starting to freak out. And he's like, go on. I said reboot. <laughs> and then the lights just stop responding to him. Then Chucky starts to do a gauge from Pet Cemetery yeah. and just starts sneaking around this guy and like slicing his ankles and legs mm -hmm. and Achilles tendon and whatnot. He stabs him in the dick at one point. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Gabe is like, I'll get you, doll. <laughs> and climbs up on this table that is a table saw. <laughs> Chucky then just slips a bolt out of this thing so that it falls at an angle. And so he doesn't fall. Gabe the pervert grabs 
melts the pipes above him. Uh, Chucky uses his ET finger magic to turn up the temperature of the water using the Caslin hot water heater temperature increaser, uh-huh. which makes the pipe hot, which makes Gabe the pervert's hand scald, and eventually Gabe the pervert lets go of the pipe, falls down, and lands on the now spinning table saw, and Gabe the pervert is split in two. He lands dick first on this thing. Yeah. After Chucky says that, you know, the line that he was given, time to open you up, see what we're dealing with. Yeah. It's a great kill. It's a really fun one because blood goes everywhere. And then Chucky grabs his brand new change of clothes and hides himself in a buddy box uh-huh. and basically gives himself to Omar to go undercover. Because Omar again is another hooligan kid in the courtyard. Andy sees this. He's like, you know, hey, this is my new buddy doll. I named him Chode. And he's <laughs> like, geez, I really hate buddy dolls it seems cool and all but i don't know detective mike gets brought down to the basement where he finds gabe the pervert cut in twain and then the movie cuts back over to zed mart where there's a promotion for the new buddy two doll which as i mentioned earlier has blonde hair and looks like a hitler youth chucky the doll is there with omar and all these kids and chucky walks over to andy and he's like Psst, andy it's me chucky i'm not really chode i'm just pretending to be chode to make you jealous come on pal can't we just be friends and andy's like no chucky we can't be friends i've got these two other friends now pug and that redheaded girl whatever her name is and chucky says <laughs> not for long say did you see what's on television today and andy turns around and it is video first of andy crying on the bed shouting how he wishes shane was gone forever and then it starts showing images of that watermelon skin face with eyeballs and teeth yeah and andy just starts freaking the holy hell out of course he does he like goes after chucky aka chode uh <laughs> as his you know pin name and omar <laughs> is steps in and is trying to keep this crazy kid from breaking his new buddy doll yeah, what are you doing man smashing up my doll chode what's wrong with you are you deaf or something oh yeah i forgot that andy wears a hearing aid in our movie for no reason yeah it gets knocked out at this point yeah. and by the way chucky is behind omar just grinning at andy with his red eyes glowing Ooh, i've really got him stirred up soon he'll be back in my arms he'll come running this way soon enough i'm playing the long game his phone comes out while he and omar are omar's phone comes out yeah and pug and phelan come to see what's what and they're like you know what maybe andy's crazy (laughs) sure so andy collects his hearing aid and grabs his phone omar's phone that's important but he realizes after he picks it up oh this isn't my phone it's omar's you know he knows it's omar's phone the screen on it was omar given the middle (laughs) that that also (laughs) which is pretty good omar's a little bit of a jerk (laughs) he named his doll chode and so we cut over to omar pug and phelan all playing video games together Uh and thanks to the fact that andy has omar's phone he can see through chucky's eyes and this buddy app that he's got you can see the chucky vision or the buddy vision or the cho division so omar is like that andy kid is a real crazy cuckoo head i don't know why you guys are friends with him and they're like i don't know that we're really friends with him anymore about this time we see a car pull up and we see detective mike's mom and she's gonna go for a ride in this autonomous vehicle it's like an uber it's a self-driving car and she gets in she's like oh lord i'm going to bingo all the girls are gonna be so impressed so she gets in the car and the car drives off and then the car just starts going bananas once it gets to the bingo hall parking lot Mm -hmm. and it drives around does donuts it goes crazy and then it ends up crashing into another car and then suddenly chucky shows up and he uses his et finger light to make the car go really crazy the car stops beside chucky and chucky looks at detective mike's mom and he says and he's my best friend detective mike's mom calls chucky a hobbit motherfucker (laughs) yeah and when she's never seen this doll and eventually the car crashes into another car but it doesn't kill detective mike's mom she gets out of the car and then chucky goes over and he takes a knife and stab 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 he kills detective mike's mom so r.i.p yeah detective mike's mom this is the only character in kill in this movie i think could have been edited out of the film but i think if they'd done that they wouldn't have hit the minimum mark to make this a feature film there's also some really good sound design in this movie which we haven't really talked about that much but when chuggy is kind of terrorizing doreen in the car you kind of hear the sound coming from all directions 
because he's talking through the, the car speakers and like the phone. phones and all kinds of yeah. yeah andy goes in and tells aubrey plaza jeepers mom i think chucky is out to kill detective mike's mom this leads to an argument where andy reveals that he has omar's phone and aubrey plaza's like what the hell why do you have omar's phone you were beating the shit out of him in zed mart now you got his phone i think you might be a crazy emotionally unstable child while that's going on detective mike finds his mom stabbed to death in the bingo parking lot yeah, he's the only detective in this town apparently he's, he's got a lot on his plate from the last 48 hours yeah i don't think they let you go to your mom's crime scene if you're the detective <laughs> on the force but maybe like you said maybe there's only like three people on the force maybe he's there to identify the body but i think that's done more at the hospital slash morgue than it is at the crime scene <laughs> andy then sees the tv come on and here we see pug and phelan talking smack about andy Andy, saying that he's a crazy kid and then this is the moment where chucky starts to kind of terrorize andy by speaking to him through all of these different electronic devices like the tv or wall speakers or whatever the hell's the roomba and the, the light fixtures or something if they don't let us play the, all your friends go away <laughs> So Aubrey Plaza walks in to see Andy just smashing the TVs and the walls with a baseball bat. Andy turns around, looks at his mom, and he's like, oh, mom, this uh, this isn't what it looked like. And she's like, yeah, right. It looks like you're losing your shit, kid. We immediately cut to Zed Mart, where I think about 17 or 18 people have shown up to purchase a Buddy 2 doll. It's a really <laughs> enthusiastic crowd. <laughs> Phelan goes over to Pug and she says, hey, there are cops in the hall. Turns out Detective Mike's mom is dead. I think Chucky the dog killed him and then phelan goes to omar and she's like give me your phone uh, because he got it back earlier when uh, aubrey plaza found out that her kid had it mm -hmm. she fires up the buddy app and she sees video footage of chucky stalking detective mike's mom and they're like oh shit chucky is the killer and then there's more footage of chucky at zed mart and he's eyeing andy and aubrey plaza so pug omar and phelan dash off to go save their friend they've kind of come around like they he was our friend and then we thought he was crazy and now he's our friend yeah. again cut to detective mike who gets photos of the now unwrapped watermelon head in a dumpster and detective mm -hmm. mike realizes that this is the package he had in his mom's house when his mom was still alive and you see this head it's kind of like cracked open and the eyeballs and the teeth and the skin are on this watermelon <laughs> it looks like sloth from the goonies a little bit and he also recognizes this wrapping paper yeah. oh i see what's going on here now this little kid is a crazy person right. we cut back to zed mart and uh, -huh. uh what was his name wes that's right the guy who works on the docks he's dressed up in a buddy doll costume with adult size overalls and striped shirt but he's got this oversized head he looks like a sports mascot and he's there for the big product reveal for those 17 or 18 people that have showed up and he walks out onto this makeshift stage in the store there are all of these other buddy dolls around but we see one of them is chucky and we know it's chucky because he's holding a knife in his hand <laughs> that's right that's a, a dead giveaway phelan pug and omar show up to fight side by side with andy to defeat chucky or something and i gotta say this is where i think our movie kind of runs out of steam at the very end mm -hmm. andy shows up to save his mom but out of nowhere detective mike a black guy body slams this white kid onto the floor of the zed mark now that's poetic bo <laughs> yeah it's pretty good and it throws the cuffs on yeah. him i mean like he's he's gonna frog march this kid right out of the zed yeah, because he's like your kid gave my now dead mother a watermelon that was wrapped in a severed face with eyeballs and teeth stuck in it right he has every right like nobody's <laughs> arguing that detective mike is not in the in the right here Aubrey Plaza shows up. She's none too happy about seeing her kid being arrested and handcuffed. But about this time, confetti explodes as the big reveal of the Buddy 2 doll happens. And then Wes, dressed up as Buddy in this little costume and ridiculously oversized head, he dances out on stage, but somehow Chucky the doll got inside the costume head and just starts stabbing Wes in the neck. Uh-huh. This whole thing turns into Act 5 of a Shakespearean tragedy. Dude, he staggers onto the stage uh -huh. lifting this head to show that he is now bleeding freely from his jugular go on <laughs> and maybe my favorite <laughs> shot of the movie happens where 
blood just splatters across this eight, nine year old girl. In her eyes, her nose, her mouth, her ears. It looked like that kid drinking from the fire hose in UHF. It blasts her with so much blood that I'm surprised she stayed on her feet. And she starts screaming, crying. It's something out of a Sam Raimi movie. It's hilarious. Yeah, like it is very clearly the directors being like, a little more blood. <laughs> all right, let's do another take, a little more blood. <laughs> All right, one more take and just use all the blood you've got. <laughs> and so M- Mike, seeing that of uh, like all hell has broken loose, he handcuffs Andy to like this rack display thing yeah. while he goes to check on Wes, who, you know, he's gone, man. Don't even bother. Yeah. And then all the lights in Zedmark go out and the giant jumbo TVs around, they all turn on and we see Henry Caslam as portrayed by Tim Matheson from earlier in our movie. He's kind of doing his best Max Headroom impression. There's a lot of blah blah blah. We at Caslin, and oh, something's wrong here. And the movie gets a little drunk on its own silliness. And Chucky uses his magical ET finger to fly drones around the store, but these drones have razor blades for propellers. And so a massacre ensues with just blood spraying everywhere. The first drone mm-hmm. comes in and really finishes off West, and then Aubrey Plaza leaps in to save Detective Mike, so that Detective Mike realizes that Andy is not the killer here he owes a debt to arby plaza for saving his life he is something detective mike rushes yeah. in and he grabs a drone before it kills pug and then detective mike gets what we think is a fatal wound he just falls to the ground and you're like r.i.p detective mike that was a pretty unceremonious exit for one of our favorite characters but don't worry he'll be back after saving pug and telling him to run is kind of the last moment you know run uh. you fools and <laughs> The Buddy Two Bears are now coming to yeah, life. Yeah, all the dolls. Like, Chucky's using his E.T. magic finger powers to turn all of the Buddy dolls to be evil and kill people. In which they are. They're just running amok. It's like this Muppet Baby version of Five Nights at Freddy's. With all these little bear dolls and animal dolls and kid dolls just running around torturing the humans that showed up to buy them earlier. That'll learn them. <laughs> Andy is about to get got by one of these Buddy Two Bears. And Fallon shows up with a head strike tremor to save him at the last minute and also frees him from his being tied up to this wire rack and so the kids are trying to climb out as the security shutters are coming down but before they get out chucky throws up on all the television screens an image of aubrey plaza all bound up like um, duct tape around her mouth and she's sweaty and bloody and just generally fucked up the kids are like look man he's trying to trick you come with us we'll call the police let them deal with this andy is like geez i really wish i could guys but i gotta save my mom and so he kicks the shopping cart out that's holding these security doors up andy runs off to go save his mom but on his way he grabs a hedge clipper and some little hatchet blade thing and here we see that chucky can talk to andy via his hearing aid which i was like maybe this isn't a hearing aid maybe it's just a bluetooth earbud andy goes into the back room which this thing as you mentioned earlier the back of this Zed Mart looks like where they hid the Ark of the Covenant at the end of Raiders. It's massive. <laughs> absolutely it, it is twice as big as anything that you saw out yeah. front it looks like you took a walgreens and attached that to a costco <laughs> that yeah that's accurate so this police car this r- little remote control police car rolls up to him and is like you know come with me uh, assailant or whatever it, it almost sounds like a robocop line he, so andy follows this remote control car which leads him to the aisle where his mom is at the end all tied up and she's right. got a new surround her neck i want to see the part of this movie where chucky tied up his mom like how he got her and grabbed her and put her in the chair and wrapped the tape around her but that was fun you want this to be more than 83 minutes is what you're telling me no i'm just saying as like an outtake or director's cut i just like to see that little puppet doll how did he get her back there did he trick her like telling her that there was red wine <laughs> <laughs> probably so i've got a box of franzia back here andy comes up and he finds his mom and then here chucky gives this evil villain speech about friendship with he 
and Andy and Chucky flips a switch and he has rigged up Aubrey Plaza to like he's tied a rope around her neck so like Chucky fashioned a noose or something so Aubrey Plaza is being stretched up into the air extending her neck even longer than it is already elegantly crafted by the Lord Almighty so Aubrey Plaza she's hanging from this rope Andy grabs the hedge clipper and starts cutting the rope a little bit but then Chucky attacks him and somehow the both of them tumble off and grab the rope that has not been cut so much that it still supports the weight of Aubrey Plaza, Chucky, and Andy. And she's just dangling below. And I was like, man, she's been deprived of oxygen long enough that if she lives, she's one, not going to be able to feed herself, and she's going to struggle to remember her ABCs. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing we didn't get another, like, compound fracture moment. Andy punches Chucky a little bit, grabs the knife that Chucky has, and he cuts the rope, and Aubrey Plaza falls. But again, to your point, no broken leg. She tucks and rolls, and she's just struggling to suck in air, having been hanging from this rope for a good 60 seconds. Yeah. And then here's where Chucky says, you know, Andy, you're broken just like me. Maybe I should cut you open and see what's wrong with you. And Chucky has a knife, but before Chucky can split Andy open, Andy starts singing the buddy song. He's like, you are my buddy until the end. More than a buddy, you're my best friend. And this just stops Chucky in his tracks. Well, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all he's ever wanted. This is what Chucky wants. He just wants his friend. Andy grabs that police car and just clocks this doll across the head. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Then he just starts stabbing Chucky in the chest Mm -hmm. until Chucky's eyes go dark. As Chucky says, I thought we were friends friends yeah andy starts making his way to his mom jeez mom are your boats coming out of your shins hold on a second let me grab a box of wine for you then chucky just comes flying through the Uh air leaping at andy and before he can get to him kapow kapow it's detective mike who has made his way back to the room he is alive and shoots this doll yeah it's a real deus ex detective mikey now then aubrey plaza is like well if he's gonna shoot the doll i'm getting in on this too glug 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 (laughs) first how about a little wine for a mama and then don't fuck with my son weird doll and then she just grabs chucky's head and pulls it off his body yeah cut to the parking lot where medical services are taking care of Aubrey Plaza and Detective Mike and they're putting him into two separate ambulances. I'm like, you know what? Detective Mike is never going to have to work another day in his life. He's going to have a hell of a lawsuit against the Caslin Corporation based on his dead mom and all this other activity. So good for him. And then we cut to Andy and his three friends standing around what's left of the Chucky doll. And the three of them just beat the shit out of it. Yeah. Speaking of a Scorsese film, (laughs) they all have sledgehammers and then they just go gangsta on this doll. Yeah. Then they burn it. This is where we start to get a little voiceover of your favorite movie star of all time, Tim Matheson, (laughs) saying, look, first of all, let's just say Caslin has has no liability here but because everyone is so important and the children are so important we are going to recall the buddy twos just to be safe everyone though deserves a friend for life as he's giving this speech about like friendship and how the Caslin corporation believes and family values and all of that stuff we see that andy and his hooligan friends are hanging out on a spray painted billboard right i guess the happiest ending we could hope for for this kid sure then we see a stock person putting a new buddy doll on the shelf and the lights go out and of course you're just waiting for this to happen but red eyes flicker to life and it smiles and then the buddy song starts playing again and that's the end of the movie it didn't need a sequel no you told your story we're good yeah i mean if you want to make a sequel and it was the same guy i'd probably check it out but does it need one nope totally fine 90% of this movie is pretty damn good I think the last 10% is a little shaky but compared to everything else we saw this season this is just five star yes it, it is not without its problems like it doesn't ever fully resolve its themes about the invasive nature of technology it could have done more with the hearing aid bit yeah. what is the ultimate fate of this family do we ever really get a moment between Aubrey Plaza and her son where she recognizes that oh he was going through this horrible struggle and now we it's made us closer than we 
were and we're going to get through this together. Like all of that stuff could have made this. You don't have that scene from Poltergeist where they push the TV out of the hotel at the end. You're right. That moment of like we have come through it and now we're on the other side and we're stronger and better right. for it. There's a movie coming out soon called Megan where the oh yeah yeah, yeah. which basically looks yeah, like yeah. the exact same movie but with girls if it's as fun as this i'm i'm totally there for it i know the kids in my life saw that megan trailer and we're like i want to see that yeah, movie. show them this save yourself a buck or yeah two. i ended up showing them paranormal activity and that got me in trouble i can see that <laughs> mm. so that's it that is the end of season 22 deja ew Again, normally this is where we would rate our movies. We did that on the upfront because we're changing things up a little bit. We're saying goodbye to Garrett. Garrett, good luck doing whatever it is you do. Please stay out of jail. Don't hurt people. And if you need a reference, don't come looking to us. And uh, as Garrett rides off into the sunset, we've got another sun that's getting ready to rise with season 23. And Bo, I got to say, I'm ready to shift gears away from horror movies. And I'm ready to shift gears mm -hmm. away from remakes. And what I want to do for the next season is I think we need to look at some original ideas for movies that aren't so good that uh, people would not pay money to actually see them in theaters. But they're original enough to make it onto a streaming service where people can just sit on their fat asses in the comfort of their own home with minimal effort and enjoy marginally okay entertainment. That's right, people. Season 23 is going to be titled Stream On! where we are going to take on six movies that were exclusively made for streaming services. Your Netflixes, your Paramount Pluses, your HBO Maxes, your Crackles. Is Crackle still a thing? I hope it is. Uh, I think so. Your Hulus, perhaps. We're talking about the type of quality movies that you used to paw through in those big wire bins of DVDs at Walmart that were three for $10. <laughs> Which I'm looking forward to because, frankly, after seeing this Child's Play remake, I feel like we, what we watched was almost too good. Yeah, we need to downshift a bit. And to kick things off, we're going to give people just what they need at this time of year with a little holiday cheer. And I'm talking about Netflix's answer to Lifetime and Hallmark Christmas movies with the Lindsay Lohan feature film Falling for Christmas, where Lindsay Lohan plays Goldie Hawn from the movie Overboard, but at a ski lodge and at Christmas, but it doesn't have any of the humor or sense of purpose that Overboard had. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. It's been, uh, quite frankly, too long uh, since we've seen uh, Lindsay Lohan on this program. I think she's only been here once. Yeah, the Herbie yeah, the movie, Herbie right? Movie. The fact that we haven't done I Know Who Killed Me is our fault that is definitely on us but we'll get around Excellent. to that so come back and see us in two weeks time it'll be just before the holidays we'll have some fun festive activities wild conversations about what it's like to get clocked on the head and how that causes you to forget who the hell you are and you piss your pants or something like that i don't know uh i, I haven't really read the intro that the interns are putting together for us so we'll wait and see what they come up with they're smart smarter Great. than me at least they're smart enough to work for free <laughs> so we're dumb enough to hire them yeah <laughs> oh are we ever excellent well listen as always like rate review you can send us an email at pick six movies at gmail.com if you have uh any thoughts questions if you have a recommendation for an original movie that was made for a streaming service email it to us because i can tell you right now we have not settled on all six movies in fact We've only settled on two, and we are digging through the big wire dumpster bin that are all of these original streaming films. So let us know if you have a recommendation, and we will certainly take it into consideration and maybe tee it up for season 23. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the Child's Play remake? Jeepers, so there's no criminal liability for dumping a watermelon head down the garbage chute? That's great! Not at all. <laughs> you are my boy. I can still get a college scholarship. Guess what, Chucky? I, I hate Garrett, too. We love Garrett. Please don't kill us. We'll see you in two weeks' time, everybody. <laughs>